So welcome back everyone. I've got a little side project that I'm going to try to knock out that I thought you might be interested in because it kind of does fit the build it or buy it thought. As I mentioned in earlier stuff, I do some woodworking also and I bought a, um, it's like the best I can tell it's about a 1970s vintage Makita combination joiner planer, six inch joiner, 12 inch planer. The other day the price was good um, the gentleman I bought it from he did uh, was forthright with it in the fact that it ran but the drive rollers or the feed rollers for the planer um, needed replaced but the price was right so I bought it and brought it home and um, it was a complete unit as pictured uh, here in the picture that I'll bring up this isn't the exact unit but this is exactly what it looked like when I got it it was complete all together and so I pulled the drive rolls out and they indeed uh, were absolutely gone. I'll show you a close up here. The, what's supposed to be rubber turned in almost like a wax type consistency, but uh, as is the case with a lot of projects I do, once I seen that, I thought, well, I'll just disassemble this next part, clean it up. And the next thing I know, I decided to do a full restoration on it. So the build it or buy it portion will be for the drive rolls themselves. They range anywhere from um, about $275 each to a little over $300 direct from Makita. So I'm going to try a, uh, my hand at pouring a urethane rubber. So that's kind of the, the build or buy it part of it. I think I can um, recover these or remold them for probably about $50 compared to the $600 for two new dry rolls. So I'll swing you around here and show you the um, huge pile of parts. Um, that this planer has turned into and then give you a close-up on the roller. So stand by here. So on the table here you can see minus this hammer and hacksaw. You can see there's completely everything here. One of the reasons why I picked it is unlike a lot of planers and joiners nowadays that there's a lot of stamped steel components or aluminum in. There's a little bit of aluminum, but um, everything, for instance, the feed table here, solid cast iron, um, the two columns are, are, are really stout. Um, most of the pieces are either cast iron or cast aluminum, so there's a lot of rigidity there. Um, some gears instead of belts and things like that. So here are the rollers. There's two of them. And this material, you can kind of see here, it's just turned into almost like a wax. It just crumbles apart, but if you squeeze it, it mushes and almost turns into like a, a grease or a wax. So that's those are supposed to be rubber. Um, and those are what drive or feed the wood through the planer portion. The joiner is fine. There's, there are no drive rolls on a joiner. So there was enough of the one left when I pulled it out to get a rough outside dimension that ranged, measured from anywhere from... Um, one inch 750 thousandths to one inch 770 thousandths. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I bought a product. I'll show you the product here in a second. That's a, I bought it online. It's a liquid urethane rubber. And um, basically it's two part. You make would be, try to get the glare down here. And so you just, I'm gonna build a mold. Um, Schedule 80 PVC worked out almost perfectly to the outside diameter. I might have to turn them down a little bit. So I'll build a form using the Schedule 80 PVC. And then I'll machine an end cap to keep the liquid urethane from flowing out. And um, the urethane, you can buy it in a different hardness. It's called durometer. So basically, if you think of a really hard rubber that's almost plastic-like, that's one number. And the softer it gets, uh, the more spongy like a pencil eraser. That's a that's a uh, that softness of that rubber is expressed in a number a numerical number that's called the durometer. So I did some research and picked the urethane that I purchased. The rubber urethane liquid that I purchased is I'm hoping about the right durometer for these uh, drive rolls. So at any rate, I'll kind of I'll get the get things set up here and show you what I'm going to do. So stand by for a minute. Okay, so I got that, what's supposed to be rubber, cleaned off of one of the shafts. Um, like I mentioned, it was kind of gooey and soft, so I just used some brake cleaning on a, on a rag and it cut it just fine. So I got it cleaned up. Um, 
they're fairly smooth the surface and I, I don't really know how what the bonding characteristics of the urethane that I'm going to use is so I thought I'd put a little bit of tooth on the shaft or some in essence some scratches in the shaft so that the urethane has a better chance of bonding to it I might even actually take the grinder I haven't decided on that might grind some grooves in it they're low speed so uh, but at any rate so I set it up in the lathe I'm gonna switch up over here I set it up in the lathe just because it makes a good place to um, to spin them and to use some really coarse sandpaper I don't have any emery cloth that coarse so I grabbed a couple of DAs that are 36 grit one thing about the rollers, they are super straight, even though they wouldn't have to be. This isn't like the mandrel that the knives go in. Um, the rollers are just, there's virtually no run out on it. Um, there is almost like a shellac coating. So I'm going to take that off with a really coarse sandpaper. close up here so that you can see the scratches in there that should hopefully get hopefully give it some bite as far as being able to slip on the shaft that shouldn't be a problem you can I think you can maybe you got something to point here with you can maybe see this stain kind of stain right there the roller came clear out to this spot right there so it actually overlaps and goes onto a different diameter on both ends it was that way so that basically captures it um, from being able to move left to right. So um, I'll move you back over here on the, the bench and we'll talk a little bit about what I'm going to do for the mold. Okay, so we're back over here at the bench. And as I mentioned, I've just got a piece of PVC is 2 inch, but it's Schedule 80, so that makes the ID um, a little bit smaller than Schedule 40. Schedule 40 would have worked, but then I would just have to trim that that much more. So let's see if I can work these backwards. You can get an idea. So the ID on this pipe varies a little bit. It's a little bit oval shaped which is one more reason why I want to turn these afterwards. So we are at, um, yeah, we're just shy of one inch, nine hundred thousandths. So, um, and I mentioned the OD of those was one inch, 750. So we'll have a couple hundred thousands to take off of there. Um, that we're just going to have to see after I get them poured and molded whether I'll be able to turn those down with a um, probably the best chance would be high speed steel tool um, sharp and really really sharp but if the rubber's a little too soft and it wants to grab I may have to to set up like a tool post grinder thing and try to grind them down so anyway we'll see because it won't hurt if they're a little bit um, if the finish is a little rough anyway that should help it grip the board better so that's kind of the plan um, so I've got to build an end cap for the piece of pipe that comes down to this diameter here. And then I'll, I haven't decided whether I'm going to just machine a PVC cap that I glued on, bore a hole in it, or whether I'll do something with aluminum or whatever. I haven't decided for sure. But basically that hole would, this shaft would slide through that hole. I'll figure out a stop that will seal the stuff from coming out and also center this shaft in the middle of the PVC. Do the same thing on the other end um, so the one bottom end would be kind of fixed I'll pour the urethane in let it fill up to the top put the top um, cap just basically is to center it one factor I took into consideration when I decided what urethane to get as well as the durometer was working time and this has a it's I think about a 20 minute working time if I remember right I'll show you the product when we get closer 
And then also whether it had to be degassed or not for someone that hasn't used um, molding or pouring products before. Some products have to be degassed either right after you mix them or after you've poured your part, they have to go in a vacuum chamber and then that's evacuated and that helps pull some of the air bubbles out. This stays working, it's, it's, it's fluid enough and it stays working long enough when I talk to the manufacturer it did not need to be degassed, so that'll make it a little bit easier in a home home environment to mold those. So anyway, I will I'll cut it off here, um, and once I figure out what I'm going to do for a um, end cap, um, I'll bring you back and show you that. So stand by. Okay, so I thought about it some. If I would have had some plastic or some PVC plugs, I probably would have done it with plugs because. It's they're quicker to machine could have glued them in but I was trying to avoid having to run into town So I dug through my scrap or my drops uh, of metal and I had a piece of uh, about two feet of aluminum round bar so I bend it down there. I cut off enough of a chunk that uh, I'll just use that it's really close. Let me grab the caliper To fit the idea of that PVC, it needed to be, I think I said one inch, nine hundred thousandths. This is exactly two inch, so that'll that'll work really well. I'll have to take very little off of it, um, and then I'll bore a hole through it, as I mentioned, and just make it to where that kind of presses into the um, the PVC and acts as a shuntering plug as well as a, a dam for the stuff. So let's get. Let's get going on that. Let me go grab my safety glasses. Operation, the first thing I'm gonna do is face it off. Sorry, the gear set on this lathe is a little noisy, so hopefully uh, that doesn't bother you too much. Okay, next thing I'll do is put a center hole. the shaft so I know so what I'm going to do to to um, incorporate a stop into this is I'll bore this hole here this diameter first all the way through um, this whole plug will probably be an inch thick or so and then I'll counter bore for the second diameter or to where that plaid that urethane was at and that's about looks like it's about a hundred and seventy thousandths or so so i'll just do a counter bore that matches this diameter 
That way when it goes down in the plug, that shoulder will sit on here and that'll act as the stop and that'll be the bottom plug. The top plug, all I need to do is um, just center it. So that'll be the next step. And this first diameter is about five. You no, know, 547, 48,000. So given this is a Makita, I'm going to assume that all of the stuff was metric. Um, so that means a half inch drill will work really well, and then I'll use the Born Bar on the rest of it. So let me grab a And that other that other end is the same same diameter, so I can I don't have to worry about the overall depth of this initial hole. I can go past what this piece will be parted off at, and then um, that'll just be the hole for the next one. I'll do a pilot hole here just so a little bit easier on the lathe. I had planned on um, doing um, everything and then parting it off, but that's going to be a lot of material to part off. The part off blade will be sticking out pretty far, so I think I'm going to turn the OD, take it over to the saw, um, the big chop saw, cut off a, basically a pretty thick the thickness plus a little bit that I need, and then I can bring back and um face it that way and finish the the boring operation so uh, i'm going to go take a little bit closer measurement on the id of that pvc and then come back here and we'll do a little bit of outside turning i just cut a piece of that off while i had it over there on the saw that way i can when i get close i can kind of hand fit it but it's measuring Probably the leg shaped it is only plastic, so it's measuring right at one inch eight ninety five three hundred nine degrees and it goes over to to one inch nine twelve so it's egg shaped a little so that puts it really close to one inch nine hundred thousandths for the round diameter so I'll get close to that and then um then start kind of custom fitting it.
So that was uh, 80 thousandths there. So that we're really close. I'll probably take another 15 and then we'll go from there. A little bit of a chamfer on it. Let's see if it'll start. This Schedule 80 is really thick wall. I'd rather have it fit a little snug. Um, that way it pretty much guarantees it isn't going to leak. Then to have it loose. Let's see if. Yeah, that taps on nice. There's no chance that's going to move. So that'll work for the OD. I think I'll, since I'm at it, I might as well cut, um, do the complete OD for both pieces. And uh, then I'll just cut off, like I said, those two slugs in the saw and come back and bore them out. So. I'll bring it back here in a sec when I've got it faced and the piece or the full length of the OD done, and then I've got the pieces cut. Okay, as you can see, I've got the piece parted off there, and um, you'll see how true it's going to run. You can see they run out in the front, but given this is just a slug, um, it's not that critical. What I'm looking at, that's the cut edge, so you wouldn't look at that anyway. I'm looking at you may be able to see through the gap in the truck there. It's like you're even lined up just right. There's very little run out on that initial machine face, so that's good enough. If it would have been a little bit thicker, I could actually press it against the back of the chuck um, to register it. But again, for just this plug for what this is, it will be perfectly fine. So we'll get this, uh, get this face. Technically that face really wouldn't have even had to been uh, machined, but it is what it is. It's nice, I guess, if it's symmetrical. Uh, I'll get the boron bar set up here. My boron bar that I have already on a quick, quick detach is a little too big, so I'll, I'm going to take a little bit, or not waste you guys' time, and get the smaller boron bar set up, and I'll bring you back. All righty. I thought I had a sleeve for the round boring bar holder, um, but I didn't to neck it down to this size boron bar, so. Um, and someone looks at it and says, oh, that's kind of uh, hokey putting a round boring bar and a tool bit holder. It is an actual combination one. It has the V in the bottom. So it holds the boring bar from being able to kick out. All right. This, I'm going to have to switch, I think, to a smaller one because this, even though it'll fit in the hole, the... Either that or grind some relief on it because it's going to hit the bottom of the hole. So I think I'll just switch where it's aluminum. I'll just switch to a smaller one. It has a little more clearance. Even this one may be a little, a little tight. We'll see.
Oh, that's gonna work okay. Thousands to go. In this part, this fit really doesn't have to be that critical. The next shoulder is the one that basically the liquid would try to leak out of. So. And since I'm pouring, I uh, have to do two of these. If I was just doing one, I wouldn't even worry about if a little bit of it leaked out and glued itself down, I could cut it all apart, but I want to be able to reuse these um, slugs. I don't care if I, I've got enough PVC pipe that I'll make two separate pipes and uh, just split them, take them apart, but I want to try to save the, the plugs. Perfect. Feels like there's maybe a thousand, maybe thousands and a half. Again, that's not the critical one. The next one is the one a little bit more critical. So that one, that shoulder needs to be. Can use a micrometer, I guess, but again, this is not that critical. We're 845, and depth-wise, we've got to go about 140. Gonna touch off here and then zero my dial. And it does need to go about another 30 thousandths, it looks like. This part, I mean, that dimension isn't going to be critical. That, that sets how much is the uh, rubber will be on there, but there was just a stain on the shaft, so that could be off by 20, 30 thousandths easy. And if I went too far, I could always face it, face it off to change that depth again. But I think that's going to put us right there. Yep. I can see just a hint of a shiny spot, so I'll take just another kiss on it. in there a little closer. 
closer. See that fit? You can see it pretty much comes up and makes that shiny line disappear. All right, so that's one of those down. Um, the other one's just going to be exact same thing, a rinse and repeat. So I will bring you back when I'm ready to insert them in the pipe and see how they fit. Okay, so I finished up that uh, second slug or plug or cap or whatever you'd like to call it. So there was the original that is this one actually pressed on just, it's got a hint. Once I kind of tapped it on there, it won't fall off by itself, which really helps it seal from leakage. And then second one looks the same. It's got the bigger hole. It'll go down here and center um, this end of it. So I'll give you a quick look at here what it'll look like when, when it's assembled. Um, I cut the, the plastic just for length. I'll basically make these flush on each end and then that'll leave enough here in the top um, that I'll put a probably a sharpie mark on the inside of the PVC so I can see it's a little hard to see that stain line. So I'll just put a sharpie in there and then I'll fill it up to that sharpie level. And then this one drops in. I did machine the outside diameter of this one a little bit smaller so it doesn't drive in as hard it just taps in and that'll be it it doesn't even have to go in all the way it's just there to hold that shaft centered in the middle of the PVC um, I'll clamp it in the vise in that upright position and let it cure so I thought about doing it actually tonight this is the next day um, but I got a couple other chores to do so I think I will um, and I think I'm pretty close to a half an hour at this one, so I think all it, I was going to do this all in one episode, but with the machining, it took a little bit longer than planned. So I think I will wrap it up here, and you can come back and see the uh, the next episode. It's a uh, I'll just give you a quick lowdown on it. It's a two to one ratio. So there's about they do it by weight, but the I think there's about two pints of part B and one pint of part A. I was hoping that was going to be enough uh, volume because they list it. They don't list it by ounces. So what I did on this, just to let you know whether the was gonna be enough volume or not, uh, after I made the first slug and I drove it in there, I just took this over and filled it up with water to the appropriate level. And there was only just a couple tiny little drips. So I, I captured that full amount of water, dumped that into a graduated container, and it worked out to be right at about um, 11 ounces of water. So um, I've got almost three pints of the product so i'll have more than enough so anyway i'll uh, see you in the next episode and we'll actually get this board and see how they come out thanks for watching